Hanford has this wide ranging impact in many areas of our life. It is fundamentally a messy subject and a messy problem. It offers us an opportunity to examine issues that are deeply personal to us, issues of memory and identity, but also our connection to other places and people, our connection to large scale things like atomic weapons and destruction, but also opportunity and science and optimism. That it is many different narratives rolled into one, some of which we're really still figuring out and grappling with. It offers us an opportunity to substantively grapple with these issues in the long term, because there are no easy solutions. If there even are solutions, there's just understanding. Welcome to My Nuclear Life. I'm Shelley Lesher. Today I'm continuing my conversation with Robert Franklin, archivist and oral historian for the Department of Energy's Hanford Collection and assistant director of the Hanford History Project at Washington State University. As you heard from the last episode, he brings many personal narratives into his telling of the Hanford Lab. In today's podcast, we will continue discussions on the waste problem, how the B reactor became a museum, and the differences between local and national interpretations of history. Towards the end of the podcast, he tells us about the experiences of African-American migrant workers from the South. This is the subject of Robert's second book, Echoes of Exclusion and Resistance, which again uses oral histories, allowing those impacted by the events to tell their own stories. We begin this conversation where we left off in the last episode. Then we circle around to a question I forgot I even asked in the middle of the last episode. But don't worry, it's still pretty easy to follow. Does Hanford still produce plutonium or finish it at all? No. Funny story about that, actually. But no. So by the late 1960s, all the reactors were shut down with the exception of N. N's the only one we haven't really talked about yet. N was the first United States and the world's first dual purpose reactor. So it was designed to produce plutonium and energy at the same time because the government couldn't be competing in the energy market. They let the state of Washington, the WPPSS, the Washington something public power supply system, WPPSS, Washington Public Power Supply System, basically this state run agency that took the steam from the end reactor, generated electricity with it, sold it to the grid, and then pumped the cooled water back into the end reactor. That electricity should have been free, by the way, because of all the taxpayer dollars that were going into Hanford. They should have been giving away electricity. That would just make us all lazy and demand electricity too cheap to meter. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> nice call back there. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. So by the late 60s, all the single pass, those eight old guys, they're all shut down. And also, by that point, you know, Johnson administration's winding down, Nixon's coming in. The U.S. realizes, you know, we have a lot of plutonium. We're at the point where it's just kind of obscene how many nuclear weapons we have. It's not really going to do us much to spend money to make more. Oh, shut your mouth. There is no missile gap. (laughs) Turns out the missile gap was a big lie. You know, if you remember Kennedy's attack on Nixon in the 1960 presidential election. But then Reagan comes in and we need more weapons. Well, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So so late 60s. Sorry to jump ahead. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. So late 60s, decision is made to shut down everything but N. And part of that is because N is this big semi plowshares type like look how great we are project also contributes to the national defense so produces energy and does that which is really makes those plowshares type people excited and he just kind of hums along for a while and then purex is processing it well people at hanford start to get really worried about stuff like detente and especially carter carter's probably the most anti-nuclear president of the nuclear age He shuts down the breeder reactor program, which Hanford had built the fast flux test facility, the first breeder reactor, and had all this promise. So Reagan comes in, right, and it's the, we got to get tough on Soviets. N had been shut down, and Purex had been shut down. They restart them. They weren't permanently shut down. They were just kind of in, like, standby. So they restart them, and it's middle 1986. N goes down for some safety upgrades. Pretty average stuff. Then Chernobyl happens. Well, the nuclear freeze movement had been growing. There's all this stuff kind of allied against those that want to keep producing. And this comes at a time, too, where there's 
greater demand for public accountability. Opponents of Hanford, especially downwinders, had been advocating to be heard. Investigative journalists are starting to pry. And the DOE is faced with this thing of, we got to release some material on Hanford. And critics are saying, and reactor seems to share some things in common with the RBMKs. They share some design concepts in common, but they're not the same reactor at all. Sorry, what are RBMKs? The RBMK is the Chernobyl type reactor. I forget exactly what RBMK stands for, but it's the design of the Chernobyl reactor. And Chernobyl was a dual purpose reactor as well. It was energy and plutonium. There's significant differences in them, which people that worked at N will tell you. What happened at Chernobyl could not really have happened at N, but that didn't do anything to appease people that, one, wanted to end nuclear weapons, were concerned about Hanford's releases, were concerned about the safety of the end reactor. You know, Windscale had proved that these things could go south really quickly, and then Chernobyl really proved that these things could go south really quickly. And people didn't really trust the DOE legacy that it got from the AEC, which the one guest about plowshares put so eloquently that they were kind of like, don't worry, everything's fine. You're safe. Trust us, we're from the government. That classic line that my dad tells me over and over again because he thinks it's a funny dad joke. So when Chernobyl happens, the end reactor basically gets put under the microscope. DOE proposes all these other safety upgrades, and they try to basically save end reactor, but public outcry is so fierce. The state orders DOE says, stop processing. In fact, there's a batch of end reactor fuel that's irradiated that they go and they stick in the K east there's the two K reactors, K East, K West. They stick it in, I think it's the East, either East or West, but one of them, they stick it in its water basin. Those are your two options, by the way. And that's the, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I believe it's East. Those reactors are both still somewhat standing because it's tough to remediate them because of all of that spent and reactor fuel that was there that's now been taken care of with the sludge problem I talked about earlier with the T plant. But they basically stick that there and say, no more processing. Purex and PFP still have enough fuel and stuff to do for a couple years, but by 87, 88, everything's winding down. They process the last of what they got. It makes its way through Purex and then through the finishing plant. They kind of wrap up all the loose edges, and by 89, 90, that's it. Everything's stored in the plutonium vault, which is just this vault in the side of Gable Mountain. Hanford transitions right away into cleanup with the tri-party contract, which was an agreement signed between DOE, Washington State Department of Ecology, and the EPA. And that's the framework for cleanup that we live under today, is this agreement that was signed. And basically, the federal money and the federal dollars transitioned right over. A lot of people in the Tri-Cities were worried that it was the end, the economic depression was coming, home prices were shattered. There was kind of a one-two because Washington Public Power Supply System embarked on this massive project to build five power reactors in the 1970s and 1980s. They built one fully, they got one with a containment dome on, and then they built another one 30%, and it went bankrupt. It was the largest public bond bankruptcy in history until the city of Detroit went bankrupt in 2016. Wow. It's a traumatic thing for people that have been here a long time. They, you say whoops. It's W-P-P-S-S, and everybody calls it whoops. Although, you know, people don't like that. It's one of those other things that old-timers don't like because it's the joke. Whoops, we went bankrupt. And that was a huge shock. I mean, that had pumped in so much money. And when that project went bankrupt, it really hurt the Tri-Cities. And then when Hanford went up, that's when Hanford had to go and the Tri-Cities had to go with being, we're contributing national defense to, like, you got to clean this up. This is the most contaminated place in America. And that machine went into overdrive. And in some ways, now it's kind of a victim of its own success. There's so much scrutiny. Hanford is such a wrap of this irradiated wasteland in some places. And a lot of that is because without that fear of eminent danger, the cleanup money might get cut. The biggest thing that, that worries people is when one administration or another says, well, we should reduce Hanford's budget. That's a lot of the budget of the DOE. And people here scramble to save the money because one, the cleanup work really does need to get done. I mean, that's a given. But two, there's that more cynical argument for jobs and all of that. And you can argue how effective is that cleanup work. We still don't have an operating plant. Part of that is because of the stuff I mentioned earlier, how complex the waste problem is. But also, you got to wonder, you look at the amount of money spent and the progress we made so far, and you got to wonder, like, seems like there's a lot of inefficiencies because there's all this government contracting and the contracts keep getting lent to these 
big companies like Lockheed and AECOM, which is GE, and all these other big companies that form small companies, temporary companies to bid on contracts. It's part of this defense contracting cycle that you can't help but feel is just a little inefficient. And that's where we are today. There's this special challenge of nuclear, and I think that's why when I first heard about your podcast, I was really interested in it because you're talking about discovering the ways in which nuclear things touch our lives. And I don't know if there's anything that quite captures our fear and imagination as much as atomic stuff does. The way it intersects with nerd culture to engineers, science, physics, politics, geopolitical things, the military. I mean, it, it really... It's everything. It's everything. It's one of the few things that really, really is this expansive and frightening and personal, but yet highly unpersonal. And that adds that special element. It's what, to me, makes atomic history in Hanford and Hanford's role in it so fascinating, but it also makes it really hard to grapple with. And I think trying to find solutions for atomic nuclear issues, especially waste, is even more complicated than any other industrial waste because of the way that it touches all our lives and all these aspects. Yes. And I didn't actually expect to go into waste because that's like a whole nother, it's a huge... Okay, that's a whole other podcast. That's a season. That's not even, yep. that's a season. Yep. Yeah. But... Uh, that's what Hanford's known for now. I mean, it, we can't escape the fact that that's also what Hanford has over Los Alamos, Rocky Flats, Oak Ridge, is we have the legacy and this big problem. We got off track, but we were talking about how Hanford was actually started to become a museum by the local folks. So let's pick up there. Okay, so yeah, the B-Reactor Museum Association is founded in 1991, and mostly retired Hanford workers with a few others. And they lobby to make a documentary, but they also want to create a museum. And one of their ideas is there's this old historic pre-Manhattan Project cookhouse slash outbuilding that still exists. It's actually beautiful. It's made out of concrete and river rock set, like a brick building, but using round river stones. It's this beautiful structure. They wanted to use that as a museum. They launched this kind of PR thing, and at first their mission is just to get, so D, or DOE has this list of, here's all the buildings we're going to remediate. We're going to take all the reactors, we're going to cocoon them, or interim safe storage to be technical. And first Burma is just like, look, DOE, will you put B reactor last on the list? That way, maybe we'll see if we can get it into a museum. And for 20 plus years, the DOE constantly said, we're not in the museum game. We're not in the museum business. We're not preservationists because they're, they're not. No. They're not. Erda wasn't. AEC isn't. That, that's not what this whole thing is about. So they don't get the documentary made, but they do capture all these amazing oral histories. And then they transition into, and this is really where a lot of these guys are savvy. And some of them, like John Fox, were local elected officials here, so they have some political will. Some of them are former DOE people that were in charge of relationships and community outreach. Like my friend Maynard, who's also a past president, was a DOE guy in charge of relationships between DOE and other stakeholders. Pretty savvy guys and gals. And they go, we need to build a coalition around this. The Smithsonian, back in like 2004, wanted to do an exhibit on the Manhattan Project. And they come out to the reactor and they say, oh, wow, there's some stuff here. We want to borrow some things. We want to redo the control room and talk about the B reactor. And that starts to get some attention. Most of the major engineering societies give it honors, like mechanical engineers, civil engineers, electrical engineers. They write a National Register of Historic Places nomination form for it, and they eventually get it to become a National Historic Landmark, which is the highest honor a building can have in America. And it actually confers some level of protection on it. Finally, the MPS, National Park Service, is like, okay, there might be something here. And that's when the lobbying effort goes to get... Because initially, the working group that is lobbied for to create this park says, okay, we'll create a Manhattan Project National Historical Park. We'll just call it MAPR for short, because that's the park's acronym, M-A-P-R. So they say, okay, we'll create MAPR. Uh, two sites, Oak Ridge and Los Alamos. That's the Manhattan Project. And people at Hanford and in Burma are like, no. You can't do this because how are you going to tell the story of Trinity? How are you going to tell the story of the weapons without Hanford? Why is Groves trying to find a site in eastern Washington? So they come out here and they finally get it. 
And then also Burma's working with state officials and elected officials like senators and representatives to push forward this legislation. And it's really this effort from 1991 to 2015 that results in DOE being forced into the museum business. DOE owns the facility. They're in charge of preserving the B reactor. Wow. The park is a joint DOE NPS venture, and they're in charge of preserving that reactor. The only thing that's going to change it is if Congress deauthorizes it as a park. And considering how much Congress gets done in a bipartisan way, so it's protected. And basically, DOE got led into the museum business. And right now, one of the big things they're doing, and I'm on a, like a local advisory committee for the park and stuff, and we've been talking about this and getting updates, is they're trying to find money and appropriations. And luckily, I got to say, the park is a really great bipartisan issue. The Democratic senators from our state support it. The Republican senators from the other states support it. But we're trying to get money. The B reactor needs a new roof because 75 years ago when they built this B reactor, they didn't build the roof to withstand 75 years. And this is the challenge of preserving a reactor. They probably didn't think the B reactor was going to last that long. Absolutely not. They were building it to end the war, and that's all. They were thinking five years, right? Right. And I, I would love to go and get somebody who had just found out in 1945, just found out what the B reactor did and bring them now and be like, yeah, little kids can come here. We can bring in Iranian nationals into the park. It's a national park. So Russians could come here uh, and tour it, take a great tour, just like anybody else. I would love to see what they would think. In that story of preservation, especially of the three sites, Hanford has the most to see. We have this tour program. We have these facilities that are open. If you take the tour, which tours are free, you just sign up and travel here. And it's really amazing that these mostly retired folks won that fight. That's not a fight that you win. Turning a nuclear reactor into a museum, that takes some real dedication. Absolutely. Did you find in your role that there's a difference between what a local organizing committee thinks is important and what, say, a national park or a, a national park service think is is important, like that interpretation. So how do you strike a balance between a local interpretation and a national interpretation? Absolutely. This is actually what my <laughs> dissertation it was going to be about that I'm just going to turn into the next book in the series, our Hanford History series. But yeah, there's a huge difference. And if anybody local is listening, I you know, hope they'll understand I'm putting on my historian hat now and just kind of examining this from a wide perspective. Yes, there is a difference. The Tri-Cities, because of its close connection with Hanford, has really personalized Hanford's role in the Manhattan Project in World War II in a way that I think people outside of the community would have a hard time understanding. And there's good reason for that. The bomb did help to end World War II. Historians agree that it wasn't the single thing that ended the war with Japan, but it, it certainly played a role. People here would say it was the thing that ended it, but again, that's where academics and the public perception are different. Because people will say that the bombs stopped the invasion of Japan, and some people had family members that were scheduled to participate in that. And yep. based on the data we had gathered from the invasion of Iwo Jima, as we crept closer to Japan, the death toll got higher. Especially when we invaded Okinawa, it was brutal, it was bloody, it was ceaseless, it was senseless. It was a preview for what invading the home islands might have looked like. It would have been an absolute bloodbath. We should be lucky it never happened. Absolutely, yeah. And anything that helped avoid that is a good thing. Just like Hitler not having the bomb is an unqualified good thing. The other argument is that, yeah, we were just talking about how many lives the U.S. was going to lose when we were attacking Japan. We didn't take into account all of the innocent women and children that the bombs killed. Right. Of course. I agree with you. But the local view of that is kind of like, well, that's war. They bomb Pearl Harbor. That's often brought up. The Bataan Death March. Look at all the Chinese women and children that the Japanese slaughtered in Nanking. I mean, the Japanese won't even admit that that happened. Still, like, they won't teach it in their history books. I'm saying that that's what people will say. Like, look, it's war. Civilians get hurt. So it's a very American-centric narrative that is told locally. Yes, and it's that the bomb saved lives. It moved from the bomb averted this thing to the bomb saved X lives. Oh. It was a force of moral good because if you look at the calculation and if you agree to the premise that hypothetical lives equal real lives, 
which you have to have that premise. But if you subscribe to that, like a lot of people do, and not even just here, I think some Americans would, the more patriotic, maybe more conservative leaning people, if you ask them about this issue, that's where they'd fall. They would say, look, we know from the invasion of Okinawa, we can extrapolate casualty rates. The bomb helping in the war saved X lives, some range. Ergo, it's a moral good. Because if the alternative is bomb or invasion, clearly bomb is good. Now, that's a false choice. It's assuming the hypothetical lives are worth real lives. I personally don't. <laughs> I don't know about when you were in school, but when I was in school, that's also what we were taught. In high school, we dropped the bomb, we won the war, we saved all these American lives, let's move on to something else. No one else was even considered. Right. And Japanese lives. If you actually had to plan an invasion of the Japanese home islands, millions of people would have died had that been carried out, likely. It's not within the realm of possibility that if that had happened, millions of people would have died. But the problem is it's all hypothetical. You have this argument a lot, don't you? Oh, I've thought about this a lot. Yes, I do. I think about this a lot because it's probably the biggest issue, this biggest theoretical, hypothetical issue surrounding Hanford. And I live in this community that, I mean, look, the mascot of Richland High School, I wasn't going to get here quite yet, but uh, just to prove a point, the mascot <laughs> of Richland High School, for those of you that aren't familiar, that's Richland is the atomic town that's connected to Hanford. They're the bombers. Now, there's been attempts to have that mascot be a B-24 bomber, but the logo is a mushroom cloud with an R underneath it. And so the bombers refers to a bomb, the Nagasaki bomb, that killed about 80,000 people. The logo of that is a mushroom cloud. Is it a toxic, deadly cloud of radionuclides and incinerated people uh, <laughs> floating around? And that, to me, as an outsider, that's akin to like being Johnstown AK-47s. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's right. macabre, but Richland changed their logo from the Columbia High Beavers to that bomb at the end of the war to celebrate. But to go back to your point about you being taught, I was taught the same thing, that the bomb helped end World War II, it brought the war to an end, it stopped a brutal war. The government had a vested interest in framing that narrative. And when you look at speeches by Stimson, Truman's Secretary of War, and Truman later himself, initially they relied on the numbers that the military had drawn up for American casualties and Japanese casualties. Initially, they stick to those numbers, but in the late 40s and early 50s, as they get asked about this question or they opine on it, they're in interviews, they're talking to reporters, they just start to escalate the number. And they just kind of throw out bigger and bigger numbers, and it becomes this accepted fact that it saves, by the end of it, it saves millions of people. And you can actually go back through their speeches. You look at that revision, and Truman and Simpson and his administration are post-revisionists on their own number. If you're working at Hanford, or you're in your patriotic American, and you were because we won World War II, you had helped that. Now you're helping the United States in the Cold War. You're afraid of Russia and communism, and maybe you don't know quite as much about it, but you don't need to know because you live in that era. Or you're a person of that era. You're just a normal person. You're not an academic, big thinking. You're just, you live, you work, you love your family, you know, yada, yada. You absorb that because one, Maybe you had family that won World War II and you're working on this project and you're working to produce this thing and you get paid good money to do it. But also the, everybody down from the president all throughout the government is saying that this was a good thing. And so that narrative, it becomes, we can challenge it. We should challenge it. We should complicate it because clearly the bomb did not by itself win the war. Sorry, everybody. It wasn't a singular thing. It was a very complex situation with many moving parts. And that's the messiness of history. And we have to make history messy. But it's easy to understand why that narrative holds traction and why people believe, some people believe the bomb is a force of moral good. Now, getting back to your question, the local community wants to embrace the science and engineering aspects of the B reactor. A lot of the stuff I wowed you with, because there is a lot of wow there. It is a science and engineering achievement. The reactor, Hanford itself, it is... From that lens, it is amazing. It is a major achievement of mankind. But there's all these other issues that orbit that or that are in conflict with it, in communication with it. 
you can't escape them. But some people try to escape it. And by focusing single-handedly on science and engineering, they want to avoid the messy survivors issue, the Hiroshima, the Nagasaki issue, the, any criticism of the U.S., and by extension, criticism of themselves. They also, though, avoid those that have been harmed by Hanford in the domestic sphere, downwinders, sick workers, who exist who have been harmed. I mean, Hanford had releases. It has affected people's health. This is a given. That's also complex because when you're talking about health and health metrics, it depends on where people lived, what they were exposed to, their own genetics. But there were affected people. There just are. Workers and downwinders. And people here don't want to talk about that either because they've internalized Hanford. It reflects badly on them. And so you get this single-minded focus. Whereas from the outside... You have anti-nuclear activists who just want to see the whole thing shut down. You have anti-nuclear historians like Kate Brown, who is very critical of nuclear energy and nuclear history, who has written some great books, but also has really been challenged by nuclear experts for some of her conclusions, rightfully so, because some of her work is not always it's firmly grounded in the science <laughs> as scientists want it to be, and draw some conclusions that are a little problematic at times, not all of it, but she does some really great things well in her book, Plutopia. It's a book I do have students read because the way it sets up the comparison between Soviet socialism and American socialism is such a valuable contribution to understanding the nuclear age. And then there's this kind of academic view of Hanford. And when I talk to academics, when I'm at conferences and I talk to people at Hanford, the first thing that comes up is how horrible this irradiated wasteland must be. Oh, you're from Richland. You must be glowing. It's such a shame. We didn't need to make any of that stuff. The whole place is doomed. It has this moral cloud of death on top of it. And that's not productive either. Right. We should yeah. listen to the downwinders. We should also listen to the science and engineering story. We should listen to the anti-nuclear activists. We should listen to the voices that see nuclear energy as a carbon-free alternative. Like, There's all of these voices that complicate the story that we should listen to. And the job of the park service in tribes, we cannot also forget the tribal aspect and angle. And We haven't touched on the No, tribes. we haven't. And uh, that is, I uh, apologize for that up front. It's not because I wanted to avoid that. It's There's a lot going on here. And this is where the Park Service is, I think, a better equipped than the DOE because they have a better relationship. They don't have a perfect relationship with tribes. The, the Park Service has a long, tortured relationship with tribes, but they've been trying with tribes for a long time. And I think they're better equipped to speak cultural resources language with the tribes. I want to say it's got to be better than the AECDOE relationship with tribes. That is bad. It is not good. <laughs> Although Franklin Mathias was a decent man when it came to the Wanapum and the Yakima and, and allowing them some access for traditional stuff. But once the Manhattan Project was over and GE and the AEC came in, yeah, that was bad. It was really bad. And I want to say that I am making an effort to contact people to discuss these issues. It's just a matter of finding the right people to discuss these issues in the in the right ways to give them oh, the, totally. the justice they deserve. You have to bring all these voices in tension. And that's the problem with the local community versus outside is they polarize to one way or the other. The local community polarizes to this kind of jingoistic America first, bomb as a force of moral good. And the outside community can't tend to polarize as Hanford's bad. If you support Hanford, you're bad. Hanford has to pay. It has to reckon with all of the harm it's caused. And we live in a world where both of those things have an element of truth to them. And that's really hard for some people to accept and to just admit that it's complicated and messy. And that to me isn't just saying a way out of it. Oh, it's messy. We shouldn't try. We should really try to like have those two conversations at the same time instead of creating spaces where we only have one. And that's the problem is such a long time we have spaces where the academics talk to the academics, local community opens up B-Reactor but tells its own story to visitors. And like hopefully with the Park Service coming in, a coalition can be built where like we create a space and the Park Service is trying really hard to do this and it takes time because it's a new park and you got to set up these conversations and have listening sessions and do that hard work and not have the Enola Gay fiasco at the Smithsonian all over again which that's totally a podcast you should do okay I could go into it really briefly so the audience has some reference point but basically to avoid a fiasco and have a space where we can have ongoing discussions 
In the mid-1990s, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the dropping of the bomb in Hiroshima, Smithsonian undertook an exhibit, a big exhibit preparation. It hired historians, anthropologists, a phalanx of really well-respected academics to work with Smithsonian Design's exhibit. And they brought in some themes. They took an honest, raw look at Hiroshima, and they brought in survivor stories. They showed pictures of destroyed buildings, of destroyed people. They also, though, told the story of the Enola Gay, the development of the bomb. Veterans, groups, and conservatives, they basically lost their minds. Wait, why? I won't cuss on here, but, well, they lost their bleeping minds because they saw it as anti-American. By telling Japanese story, and you can Google Enola Gay exhibit, and American Legion and others, they got really upset. And they started attacking the Smithsonian. And this was right at the era of that Republican resurgence, that Newt Gingrich combative, transactional, political, the tone of Washington we have now. It started with Newt and his guys, the oh, contract yeah, yeah, with America. Yeah. They came in and they took up this issue and they said, Smithsonian, we're going to destroy your funding if you don't change this. And a bunch of people got fired. They had to totally rework the exhibit. It went to just basic patriotic tones. The bomb ended World War II. Here's the amazing development of the bomb. And people got fired and a couple careers got ruined. I guess looking back, though, that's ridiculous because history has lots of sides. And there's so many people involved and so many voices and you can't just elevate one. A lot of people want to hear good stories. They want to hear simple narratives. I've conducted over 150 oral histories here as part of our Hand for Oral History project. And one of the questions I always ask I end every interview with is, what would you like future generations to know about your work at Hanford during the Cold War? Because I don't interview very many Manhattan Project people. If I do occasionally get someone who's like 95, I'll ask them right. about the Manhattan Project. But it's oh, usually Cold War people. N over 99% of them say, I want them to know that the bomb helped win World War II, ended World War II, and saved lives. And I ask people a question about the Cold War. I want to ask them about defense, and mad, and detente, and they answer it that way, because that simple narrative, that comforting narrative, that internalization, that association, they've associated themselves with Hanford, is a really powerful thing. It's a tough thing to unbuckle from. And I think we do that with things in our lives. Oh, absolutely. I think this gets into questions of human nature, way bigger than the scope of this podcast or even the discipline of history can examine. But it's a useful window into these issues and people and these discussions. And so it's easy to see how veterans of World War II and their families would have really felt attacked by the Enola Gay. Now, I think the Smithsonian buckled. The problem is, is that when I first heard about this park and I got here, I said, oh, cool. So we, we've created a park that's basically the permanent theme of the Enola Gay exhibit <laughs> <laughs> that the Smithsonian, you know, the people got fired from. And it was all over the headlines and, you know, the Republicans were going to scorched earth destroy the Smithsonian. Wait, and you still took the job? I'm not a Park Service employee. I don't work for the park per se. I I've been managing the DOE's Hanford collection, which is this archive and artifact collection from the site that tries its best to capture the history of plutonium processing. And we work with museums and with the park to display that at the B Reactor and do exhibits and our oral history project. We write academic books about issues surrounding Hanford. But yeah, I mean, I'm involved in that discussion, certainly. And that's why I have this discussion about Hanford's role and the, the role of the bomb. Yeah, I did decide to take that because... What a cool thing to reckon with. It stirs up so much emotion and thought in people. No disrespect to any other field of history, but like my master's thesis was on agricultural history. I studied New Deal farming projects. That's personal to me because I grew up in a town that was created by the New Deal and at the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. It doesn't elicit <laughs> this kind of like, <laughs> it doesn't affect human history the way that this does. And it doesn't affect our present and our future the way that this does. This is a subject that crosses disciplines, it crosses time and space, but it's a tough thing for the park. And when people criticize the park for moving too slowly, I look back at Enola Gay and I'm like, they're learning from history. This is what's frustrating to people that want simple narratives, but history is changing, it's ongoing. There's many different perspectives and there's lots of work to be done because as we evolve, our understanding of the past evolves. And so there's still more room to tell that story and complicate the narrative. So talking about 
different narratives. You wrote about the Hanford's role in African-American migration to the Pacific Northwest that I think is fascinating. How did all of these good jobs and high wages change Richland? Well, it's a funny thing is it didn't change Richland that much at all. But you have all these African-American workers coming. So how did Richland not change? Richland was the bedroom community for the operators of Hanford. Hanford Construction Camp was the home for the people that did the hard work of building Hanford, both the facilities, but also all of the infrastructure that you need and take care of those workers. Now, that Hanford Construction Camp couldn't hold everybody that Hanford hired, so people spilled out into the neighboring towns of Kennewick and Pasco, and even actually some people lived even further out wherever they could find housing. African Americans found segregation in the Manhattan Project. Its army was segregated at this time, but many were not surprised but unhappy to find segregation willingly enforced in the Pacific Northwest outside of the Hanford site. The towns of Kennewick, Kennewick prided itself for decades as being a lily white town, even was known as a sundown town and had a sign on its bridge or there's reported to have been a sign on the bridge. Whether the sign actually existed or not doesn't matter because everybody knew that you had to be out of Kennewick by dark if you were black. Pasco, as a railroad town, had already had the wrong side of the tracks, in this case East Pasco, separated from West Pasco by the largest railroad hub west of the Mississippi, so a pretty imposing bit of infrastructure, where in previous decades, Chinese American and Japanese American and African American railroad laborers lived, and that area flooded in with African American migrants who worked at Hanford but could not find housing in the, either the trailer camp or the barracks themselves. So were whole families migrating to the Hanford plant, or was it just the primary worker? Yes and no, and over time. Most left their kids, like Van Daniels, who I talked about earlier. His father came up and his uncle. They left the kids back in Texas, but brought them up in the late 40s, early 50s, when they had found semi-permanent work here and, and knew they wanted to leave the South as part of the Great Migration. And in this way, Hanford is part of the Great Migration, which is the largest migration in American history. Six million Americans from World War I through 1970 move, are internally displaced because of Jim Crow to outside of the South. Many of them leave situations that were violent and economic hardships and find in these new communities many of the same economic hardships and racial violence and segregation that they had left, very disappointingly. Not surprisingly, but very disappointingly. Because African Americans were savvy enough and knew enough from other relatives or people that had moved north that it was not a paradise, that racial tension very much existed. Pasco, first of all, wanted them all to live in East Pasco, but Pasco actually went to DuPont, the contractor for Hanford, and said, if you're going to hire African Americans, you have to limit it. DuPont worked with the Fair Employment Practices Commission and the, the MED, the Manhattan the Engineer District, to say, well... Somewhere around 10 to 15% of our workforce will be African-American, and that'll be enough to meet the FEPC defense contractor guidelines, but also not upset the white workforce or really the white surrounding population of the Tri-Cities. Because the southern white workforce that they recruited was used to the presence of African-Americans. It was largely the people in the Pacific Northwest that were hostile to interlopers, and they were wary of African-Americans moving here because they felt it wasn't their home. Wait, hold on. They weren't upset about Southern white people moving. They were upset about Southern non-white people moving in. Yeah, not as much. I mean, some of the old timers were like, we don't want any, you know, these new people are going to change the character of the place. But most of that was directed at African-Americans. They felt that African-Americans lived in the South. That's what they associated the South with or that, you know, them with like you live in the South. That's not really the narrative, again, in history class that you're yeah. taught, right? That right. No, the South not. is not hospitable to African Americans, but the North, it's this nice place for everyone. The welcoming white North that saw race riots during World War II in Chicago and Seattle and Detroit and Oh, yeah, New York. that, one. that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, those welcoming ones. The Northern civil rights struggle is one of the most overlooked, untaught parts of our civil rights history. The Pacific Northwest, from its very founding, the creation of the Oregon Territory with James Polk in the 1840s, the very first Oregon Territory Constitution barred blacks from entering Oregon Territory, being brought in as slaves or as entering in their own free will. How can you bar a whole group of people? I mean, I understand barring slaves, like 
that makes sense. But then saying, like, if you're not white, you can't even be here. How do you enforce that? And even when that was created, there were a few black people living in what became Oregon Territory who were like, so does this mean we have to leave? It wasn't enforced, but it existed. And, and early territorial legislature documents show that there was this really attempt to police what would become the racial makeup of the Pacific Northwest. And so that exists from the very beginning, this contentious, discriminatory relationship. So DuPont and the DOE, they upset this standard then. Not the DOE, remember the... The engineering district. Manhattan district, yeah, the U.S. Corps of Engineers. So they have to hire African Americans. As Franklin Roosevelt is part of the New Deal extension to African Americans, as early federal civil rights had mandated that if you get defense contracts, it's basically early affirmative action law. You have to hire a certain percentage of African American workers because African Americans make up a certain percent of population. And Roosevelt and the federal government couldn't force private businesses to hire blacks. That would have been unconstitutional. Right. And it would have been heavily resisted. But he could say, look, you're going to get taxpayer money. Your workforce has to represent the taxpaying base. And this is the story of a lot of progressive laws in our country is the federal government leads. The rest of us follow because the federal government can't set this tone. And this is also the start, the very long start of the migration from African-Americans from identifying primarily as Republican to identifying primarily as Democrat kind of starts in the New Deal, really picks up steam in the 50s and 60s as Democrats embraced civil rights. But this is the beginning, early, early beginnings of that. Another subject I teach about in U.S. history. So yeah, DuPont says we got to hire them. And Pasco says, look, if you're going to hire them and you want to come here, we ask that you give them all a train ticket back when they're done. You need to pay for them to go back south. And DuPont Sure, shakes their hand, and then I think they had their fingers crossed. They never did it, and I don't think they had any plans to. I think they realized how silly that was. We can't make them leave. No. (laughs) But that's emblematic, though, of how Tri-City, Pasco wanted to control the the population and set its own racial narrative. The Pasco Herald, the newspaper in 1943 and 44, had these series of reports on what it called its Negro problem, and that's using the parlance of the time. That's the actual term that they gave it. And this was twofold because, one, they felt they had this issue with Hanford, with thousands of African Americans migrating. But also, Pasco was home to the U.S. Naval Air Station, as well as this Pasco Reconsignment Depot, the largest railroad hub west of the Mississippi, where stuff that was going into the Pacific Theater was routed through Pasco. So thousands of people were moving in, and as the Navy came in to run And this is the Pasco Naval Air Station is where the Navy trained all of its pilots for the Pacific. This major area, there were African Americans. There were hundreds of African American servicemen that came in to Pasco. And Pasco City leaders were also like, okay, they're on the base. We never had to deal with young African American men looking at white women in the street or wanting to dance with white women or trying to go to eat. Because while there had been African-Americans in Pasco, the 1940 census recorded 28. That was, I think, to Pasco a manageable number where they could say, well, you know, those are the good ones. You know, they work for the railroad, yada, yada. But now we're talking about thousands of people. When you say 28, you don't mean 28 families. You mean 28 individual people. 28 African-Americans. Whereas by 1950, it's over 2,000. The city administrators must have just been out of their minds. Not only was that happening, but the Tri-Cities population, Kennewick and Richland and Pasco together were five, 6,000 in the beginning of the war. And Richland, at the end of the war, it, it's this bedroom community for Hanford, but it, it's like almost 18,000 people. And Kennewick and Pasco have mushroomed as well. Because all of these federal projects are coming in, and in the late 40s, they're building more dams in the Columbia, Hanford's expanding, and they're bringing all this irrigation water to the Columbia Basin. These towns are transformed, and they struggle with this influx of people, and they struggle with a new diversity that they had not experienced at that level. Pasco's really unique. Earlier, I mentioned how Hanford and White Bluffs, they have this mundane-ish, like, West history in the arid West, except for the fact that they're ended by the Manhattan Project. Right. Pasco is part of this great migration. And in that way, it's similar to stories in Los Angeles and Seattle and Portland. But what makes Pasco different is, one, in 1950, 20% of Pasco is black. That's a larger share of the population than 
anywhere outside of Los Angeles in the entire West Coast. So per the town, very large black population, 20%. Also, Pasco is the only really rural area in the Pacific Northwest, really in the whole, most of the West Coast that African Americans migrate to. It's almost all urban areas. But Pasco's pretty rural. It's in eastern Washington. It's not a city that most people know. Yeah, I, I didn't know it. Yeah, I don't blame you. And so that's unique. That's different. That's this impact. And so you have also this rural area struggling to deal with this major influx of people that it had not had any experience with. And the racism and segregation comes right to the front. I mean, James Pruitt, who I didn't interview, he passed away by the time I started my project, but I, we gathered his interview. And I want to say that a lot of my work that came to fruition in the book, the interviews I did, I was aided heavily by the African-American community, the Tri-Cities, especially the African-American Community Cultural and Educational Society, Access. Maybe you could put a link in the description to their website. Just really want to shout them out because they were instrumental in helping me connect with the Black community here and privileged me with telling their story. I mean, I feel honored. I'll put a link to them on the webpage. Thank you. I really appreciate that. They were an immense help. But James Pruitt, who was later a leader of CORE, the Pasco chapter of CORE, the Congress on Racial Equality in the 60s. He came here when he was 18 in 1948, and he said, when I got here, I saw the same thing I had left in Mississippi, and I was disappointed and mad as hell. I mean, he immediately recognized it for what it was. The housing that African Americans had was a collection of dilapidated automobile trailers, shacks, sometimes literally shanties. Most houses had no running water, Many, if had electricity, had a single light bulb. People up through the 1950s and early 60s were cooking on wood stoves as well as heating their homes on wood stoves. They also uh, had no street lights, had no sewer system. There was no African-Americans up through the mid-60s that worked for the city of Pasco, were on the police force. African-Americans were generally not hired for permanent jobs with GE. Very few lived in Richland. There were a few exceptions, but they weren't hired as scientists. They were mostly hired as temporary you know, laborers or maybe janitors. Several of the people I interviewed, their parents came and worked pretty menial-type domestic labor positions that still paid much better than the South. They were segregated into certain types of labor. They were discriminated against into certain labor positions. They were not offered the same types of jobs. Pay had to be the same for black and white workers. But white workers could advance into supervisory roles. They could be hired on full time. There was a litany of jobs at Hanford that up until the civil rights era and affirmative action legislation, African-Americans were not considered for. They just weren't. And that's the racial bias and the racial discrimination at work. And when you describe these shanties in these towns and this lack of electricity, it wasn't because the workers couldn't afford it because they were making good money. The city of Pasco didn't want to extend those services to them. And they lobbied hard. And that's what a lot of the civil rights work, the NAACP, the core, lobbied the city of Pasco. First of all, lobbied Kennewick to allow African-Americans to live there, which they were finally able to in the mid-1960s. Kennewick passed a fair housing ordinance and first African-American renter moved in, although that person faced racial threats from the KKK or people claiming to be the KKK. The city of Pasco didn't want to extend those services. And that was the focus of civil rights work here in the Tri-Cities was really just to get basic necessities. And while the pay was the same, I worked out in 1940. Eight, an alphabet house would run you fully furnished around thirty dollars a month. Okay, and this is what a white worker would get is one of the alphabet houses. Yeah, in the town of Richland, in East Pasco, the average rent for a dilapidated automobile trailer was sixty to eighty dollars a month. White landlords who owned that land rented these slum houses out at exorbitant rates to blacks because they knew they were making good money. This is the way that structural inequality works to keep poor people poor and black people down and also redlining home loans. There was no banks that were lending to African-Americans at this time. No one could get a mortgage. They could own some businesses. They were able to save up money. And there was a thriving black community in East Pasco and black owned businesses But it was a result of segregation and the lack of the white community to integrate African-Americans and provide them accommodation. Did the black workers stick around after building B-plant and after the initial 
surge of these labor jobs? Most didn't. Hanford is constructed by the beginning of 1945. Everything's running. And most left to go to other war work. Maybe they went to build ships in Bremerton or went down to Vanport, which was the major Kaiser shipyard, or to another project. A few stayed. But again, most couldn't get hired on with DuPont. But many migrated back after the war because two things really happen. One, the government goes on a dam building spree on the Columbia and Snake Rivers and many dams. And what are dams? They're large concrete structures. What did many African Americans have experience in building? Large, Large concrete concrete structures. structures. And in fact, concrete work was one of the things that African American labor was allowed to specialize in. The Haber's Union and the Bricklayer's Union were some of the only specific unions open to African Americans besides the general labor union. Concrete work is hard. It's backbreaking. It's you're out, you're mixing the stuff. It's a little dangerous. And so African Americans got the chance to become skilled and, and familiar with that and were hired on to do a lot of that work because they worked really hard. That money was transformative for them. And so the dams were constructed, but also from 1947 through the mid fifties, Hanford builds five more reactors and a bunch of other facilities. And so there's between people move for the Manhattan Project, a lot of them move away, but many of them come back as they remember those jobs. And it looks like some more permanent employment is going to be opening up. They were familiar with the area and they said, you know, this is a place that is a little more rural. Some of it maybe is a little bit more like the farm areas that they had come from that might have been more familiar than city life, might have been felt more welcoming in some aspects than city life or more free, more open. And so many people do come to Pasco and many families, in some cases, whole towns in the South almost uprooted or the entire black section of town, which in some towns was most of the town. For a lot of folks here in doing this project, it's Kildare, Texas was a big one. And Kildare really doesn't exist anymore. It had to incorporate with a neighboring town. And I found one of my co-authors and I found a newspaper from Kildare, Linden, whatever newspaper. It's like eight years old. It's basically an obituary for the town where it was white folks remembering Kildare and saying, yeah, Kildare is pretty much dead now. Everybody moved away. And I was like, yeah, everybody moved away because they were sharecroppers and that sucks. And they didn't want to live in East Texas anymore. Your town's dead. And it's hard to feel sad for them. I know they're remembering their childhood and kind of the vibrancy of the town, but it's like that was built on black labor. And those people had a chance to move upward and onward. And it smacks a little tone deaf to be like, remember the good old days? Absolutely. You're like, yeah, it turns out the good old days. Not good for everyone. I tell my students, we always romanticize history. Very rarely do we really get at the meat. And in this instance, yeah, it's very much over-romanticized, that era of history by some people. And so there's those strong connections. You know, people move and they write back and they say, hey, there's good jobs up here. There's some issues, but your kids can go to school with white kids. Schools are decent. You can make enough money to just have a life. Well, and I'm here, right? I'm here, your old neighbor's here, and so you have an automatic community. You don't have to go somewhere and be by yourself. Yeah. I mean, people really escaped crushing poverty. It's hard to imagine how transformative that was, but yet also, though, how disappointing to come and then see we cater to white trade only signs or to know that you're not welcome in Kennewick after dark. There was more battles to fight, but it was a step in a different direction. When did that change for African-American workers and families? It really began to change in the 60s with civil rights, both civil rights activism and NAACP reactivated their chapter. There had been an NAACP chapter in World War II. Once people had moved away, that had kind of faded. It got reactivated core Congress on racial equality. There was even a very small kind of moribund Black Panther party in Pasco that didn't get a ton of traction, but they were there. That sort of changed in the 60s with a mix of local activism, but also Hanford's federal, right? And yep. contractors have to follow federal rules. And so affirmative action legislation meant that GE and others, Rockwell and Westinghouse, had to go and hire some black engineers. They had to go to HBCUs and find black scientists, find black engineers. Pasco School District, because they got federal money, and to their credit, they embraced this. Lewis Ferrari, the superintendent of Pasco School District, went 
and found black teachers. I interviewed a couple that were specifically hired to come to Pasco. We need you. There's a black community here. And so they went out and they identified non-white. And there were some others, Asian American teachers as well. But there was that effort made at the federal level. And again, that's that other story of civil rights where the government leads. And then that influence trickles down and it doesn't like everything that trickles down it doesn't trickle down equally and what starts at the top doesn't all make it to the bottom no. but you see that start to change and then what changed for East Pasco was another major event of the civil rights era urban renewal came and redeveloped East Pasco similar to what had happened to the peoples of the Hanford site where they had received pretty small bids didn't have a lot of choice didn't have a lot of savings and faced higher costs or the issues of relocating, urban renewal redeveloped East Pasco. It did not adequately treat the residents of East Pasco fairly. If the houses were judged good enough to save, there might be some assistance made to upgrade them, but basically they bought condemned properties, gave people a little bit of money and said, here you go. And now they faced a broader housing market where they were in competition with whites. And as they started to move into other areas of West Pasco or Kennewick, that triggered a subject that is touchy for a lot of people and that we don't talk about enough in this country, and that's white flight. Yes. And that combined with here in Tri-Cities, that was also the start of the end of the Bracero program, which recruited Latino migrant labor and the start of, for this size community, large-scale Latin migration in the 70s and 80s for agricultural and then especially El Salvadorian migration during the Civil War there, people fleeing conflict, which... Now, Pasco's like 70-something percent Latino, and Kennewick is like 40, Richland's like 20, but the Tri-Cities as a whole, this is a pretty diverse place, and the African-American population is much smaller than it was in 1950. And that torch, with those issues, that structural inequality, that kind of latent prejudice, that torch got passed to Latinos. They became the essential workers, but also the people underrepresented in government. Latinos make up... 40% of Kennewick, and there's no Latino council people. There's very few Latino police officers. There's that overrepresented in some areas, drastically underrepresented in others. Right. And that, me and my, my co author Bob have really kind of identified that as that's the next story of the Tri Cities. And that's the evolving story, not so much connected to Hanford, but still connected to these really large processes and connected to Hanford in that that torch was passed, that burden. Was passed. I shouldn't even call it a torch, right? It's a burden. It's a burden. Yeah. Unfortunately, it gets passed instead of just ended. And for a lot of the black community, a lot of people's kids moved away seeking, just like millennials and other younger generations have had to move to find they have less secure economic viability. The good jobs of the pensions are gone, but also many of them wanted to seek education. They had more opportunities to go to college. They had more mobility. That black community here has really shrunk. It's still here. There are really vibrant efforts of it. Every year, Pasco has a pretty great Juneteenth celebration. The community shrank, but the issues are still there. I mean, the issues, all the stuff that this summer kicked up that have always been here, that I should say kicked up, that brought fleeting light to by the media, the stuff around George Floyd that I think we've all almost kind of forgotten about again, as we are wont to do in this country, that brought up that those issues are still here and that they're now shared among other groups, including a group that, you know, in Pasco is the, actually the majority of citizens who have some representation in Pasco, but still, though, largely this history of Hanford is and the people driving Tri-Cities history and a lot of the movers and shakers in this community are, are still white. And so there's still that kind of racialized history here. So I'm going to end with your question. What would you like future generations to know about your work at Hanford? <laughs> How dare you? What would I want them to know? You've never thought about this? You asked it to hundreds of people and you've never? No, I have, but it changes all the time. I would want people to understand that Hanford has this wide-ranging impact in many areas of our life. It is fundamentally a messy subject and a messy problem. It offers us an opportunity to examine issues that are deeply personal to us, issues of memory and identity, but also our connection to other places and people, our connection to large-scale things like atomic weapons and destruction, but also opportunity and science and optimism, the Manhattan Project. 
that it is many different narratives rolled into one, some of which we're really still figuring out and grappling with. It offers us an opportunity to substantively grapple with these issues in the long term because there are no easy solutions. If there even are solutions, there's just understanding. And so Hanford, especially the Cold War, offers us that. We have so much more. The Manhattan Project's neat. It's got this nice little beginning and end point. It had a product it produced. It, we can all feel a certain way about it because we, we like that certainty of story. We're still being shaped by the Cold War. It's maybe not even ended. It touches our lives and will continue to do so. It ended, but not really, because... Yeah, the historians like to have a date get ended on this day, but it's like, eh, has it actually ended? I would say it shifted in the late 80s. I would say it shifted its tone and it shifted, but the conflict was still there. It just went a little colder, but also we t turned it into this kind of neoliberal, globalized world, and those issues just got imported. They kind of mutated in that and expressed themselves in different ways, like some sort of mutated gene, but it's in there. It's the DNA of our lives. That's yeah, pretty good for just thinking that up on the spot. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> but that's what I'd want them to know. I'd want them to understand that we have a lot more reckoning to do with the Cold War and that the story of Hanford, it begins in the Manhattan Project, but to me, it's this really profound Cold War story. It touches on issues of race. It touches on these world issues. It's also though touches on really personal and it can become personal because it touches people. It touches people that work there. It touches the people affected by it. It's complicated. It's messy. And that's why it's great. Thank you for listening. I had a really great afternoon speaking with Robert, and I would like to thank him again for taking time out of his busy schedule to record with me. I would also like to thank Lexi Weghorn for all of her help with this podcast. There is actually more material not included in these two episodes, believe it or not, and you can access it and other bonus material using Patreon. The link is in the show notes, as is our website. Please send us email at mynuclearlife at protonmail.com and rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts. And of course, tell a friend. Until next time, I'm Shelley Lesher, and this has been My Nuclear Life. <laughs>